Was Jesus a magician? Today, I discuss this with Dr. Andrew Henry, and we bring up Morton Smith's book on Jesus the Magician, what he got right, and maybe what he got wrong. But there is early depictions of Jesus with a wand, as the thumbnail depicts, and maybe there is some details that make the implication that he may have been a miracle worker. But what about this word magician? Where does it come from? Take a deep dive with us. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Myth Vision Podcast. I have a new setting. I'm in the process of moving my home. Forgive me for the green background. I have a special guest today, Andrew Henry, Dr. Andrew Henry. How are you, my friend? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining me. Um, I look forward to talk about magic. And of course, in the ancient world, we're going to be discussing some of Morton Smith's work on Jesus the Magician. And I must admit my ignorance on this part. I have not read his work, but I am acquainted with the concept. And I, I know that you are thoroughly aware of his arguments. And uh, before we did this show, you said, there's some good things and there's some bad things. So for our channel, if you don't mind, tell us what your background is. And uh, that way we understand that you know a thing or two and we can proceed. Sure. Yeah. So I'm a scholar of early Christianity. I guess technically I'd say late Roman religion because I study a little bit of late Roman Judaism, uh, Greco-Roman traditional religions, uh, you know, pagan cults. Um, my focus is on magic and demonology. Um, as we'll get into it, you know, I, I use the word magic very loosely because it's one of those in, impossibly difficult uh, terms to describe. Um, so I got my PhD in religious studies from Boston University, focusing on those topics. And I focus really on the materiality of religion. So that means the, the stuff that people use in their religious practice, whether that's amulets or curse tablets, or uh, one of my favorite objects is called an incantation bowl or a demon bowl, which are these clay bowls that people would inscribe incantations inside to try to trap demons or to keep demons out of your household. So the religious stuff, I'm not so much a textual historian as much as I'm uh, a little bit of anthropology, a little bit of archaeology, focusing on the materiality of religion. So it looks like you've excavated a little in Athens as well, which is a fascinating place I love. And I've been growing more suspicious towards the Greco-Roman side of things when it comes to New Testament studies, mm -hmm. because I think it's a lacuna, I mean, that can be explored deeper. I think we have this this concept in our mind that the Jews were so holy and so separate that not even Hellenism was seeping out of their pores. And I just, I think we're starting to turn the tables on this idea that Hellenism has seeped into every pore of all the Jews. Even the most religious seem to have been impacted by the ideas of the Greco-Roman world, the empires that conquered and were, of course, in charge. So as far as magic goes, let's get right into the deep end. I think it's important to say Jesus is accused within the New Testament of casting out Beelzebub by the power of Beelzebub. I mean, mm -hmm. he sounds like what we would think non-religious people. Um, that's superstitious. That seems kind of magical, weird. Like, what is this guy up to? What is magic? I mean, do we even know what we're talking about here? Yeah. So, yeah, let's let's dial back a little bit and try to define what magic is. Um, it, it comes from the Greek word magia or magia, um, which means the practices or art of the magi, which were Persian religious functionaries. You know, they were actual priests who did priestly things like sacrifices, divination. But very early in Greek history, so Herodotus, the famous Greek historian, as early as like the sixth century BCE. Greeks were starting to talk about the Magi because there was this cultural interchange with the Persians. And for some Greek authors, they were trying to be very uh, accurate and ethnographic, like, oh, the Magi do this, they do this. Uh, there's a whole story about one Magi in his like political machinations that Herodotus includes in his, his history. But other Greeks at the same time were kind of exoticizing them. The Magi do uncanny things. They interpret dreams. They do human sacrifice. They make you know, they concoct poisons and weird spells. So from the very start, there was kind of this exoticizing tendency to talk about who these magi were. Um, you, 
dial forward to the Roman period, and this just takes off. Like uh, Pliny the Pliny the Elder, who's this famous Roman uh, geographer and historian, has this whole section on the art of the Magi. He's like Magia is this. It's a bunch of charlatans. It's a bunch of cheap tricks and evil tricks. Uh, and he even ties it to the Zoroastrians. He's like, Zoroaster was the first magician. So for him, he's using this word magia and magi in a very specific sense. It's kind of exoticizing. It's even a little bit xenophobic, like those weird Persians do weird stuff and we don't. Um, but at the same time, the, the word is being used in a more ethnographic sense. So famously, the the magi show up in the Gospel of Matthew, bringing gifts to the the young Jesus. And so those magi are being cast in a very positive light that these pagans from far away were able to read the stars and see that this, this, you know, newborn baby is, is the king of the Jews. So not, so even in the Roman period, the, the term is still very squishy. Um, but it's very much laden with the, you know, negative pejorative connotations. It's, so, it's similar to what I found in my recent interview with Steve Mason on the term zealot. And in fact, that you think they're bad because Josephus paints these zealots in a, such a negative light that the definition itself becomes derogatory over time in our modern dictionaries. But in reality, it's just someone who ha has an extreme zeal for whatever it is. It can be good or it can be bad. And so this idea of magic, it takes on that kind of connotation. But are you suggesting that there is a time in which it didn't necessarily have a negative pejorative and and it ends up becoming that um even in our earliest sources so we're talking sixth century bce so really you know far back in greek history it was it had parallel uses so herodotus seems to use it in a very ethnographic sense uh, there's this one papyrus that kind of puts them in the same ballpark as like charlatans and poisoners and stuff like that so it has like a parallel definition from a from a, the very start and we see this go through the roman period so the gospel of matthew i don't think matthew seems to view them in a negative sense uh plenty the plenty the elder definitely negative sense um and then there's this other greek philosopher Celsus, who famously attacks christianity who calls jesus amagus and for him that means cheap trickster someone who leverages the power of demons so it's very much a you know parallel usage but I would say the overarching usage is pejorative. Like, uh, if you're a Greek or a Roman, you don't want to call yourself a magus. And as far as I know, there's never a self, no, nobody ever self defines as a magus. It's usually a term of accusation. So, Simon Magus is this other famous character. He shows up in the book of Acts as this worker of Magia. Um, but then these apocryphal gospels and apocryphal acts in the following centuries, Simon Magus becomes like the arch nemesis of the Apostle Peter and the Apostle Paul. He does all sorts of demon possessed miracles. Uh, so, for, you know, uh, so Simon Magus, you know, that's a term of accusation. He is a Magus. And by Magus, we mean not a Persian religious functionary in an ethnographic sense. We mean an evil demon user of illegit illegitimate ritual. So basically, it becomes a cipher for illegitimate ritual. And you can kind of see the problem there. Who decides what's legitimate or Ill illegitimate? You know, this is not a uh, academic term. This is a term of accusation, very much like a term like apostate. Uh, you know, that's a term that you would use against your theological rivals. It makes me go back to the opening of, of uh, Morton Smith's book, where he actually points out in group, out group. And he's, would you say he's correct on this approach that it's this kind of in group, out group? Um, demonizing, so to speak, and that that's a proper approach. So Jesus to a Christian would be Jesus, the son of God. Jesus to Celsus would be Jesus, the magician or the charlatan or something to that effect. Yeah. So for that, I would agree. I think magia as a term becomes a bucket into which you throw it illegitimate ritual. Okay. That person does magia. That person does magia. We don't do magia though. And sometimes like the rituals they're throwing into that bucket look exactly the same as what you're doing, but just in a different valence. So one of the most interesting Christian writers, in my opinion, is the Bishop of Antioch, John Chrysostom, who was a Bishop of Antioch in the fourth century. He, he published bunches and bunches of homilies, you know, sermons he was giving in his basilica. And he has these great uh, sermons against amulets. So little talisman you'd wear as a necklace or in your pocket to protect you from sickness or demons. And he's like, uh, you know, those silly people wearing coins with the face of Alexander the Great on them, you know, as an amulet. You know, how dare they put their trust in a Greek king when you could put your trust in the king of everything, you know, Jesus Christ. 
Uh, he makes fun of people using gospel amulets, so taking a little scrap of the gospels and wearing them as necklaces. He's like, that's stupid. This is silly. Don't do that. But then like a few sermons later, he's like, if you ever go to a demon infested place, make sure you do the sign of the cross over your forehead because that will protect <laughs> you from demons. And I'm like, what's the functional difference? It's a ritual to protect you from demonic invasion versus, you know, the person wearing a coin with Alexander the Great's face on it. It's a ritual meant to protect you from malevolent forces, uh, sickness. Like they're both protective ritual. But for, for John Chrysostom, one of those is Magia and one of those is good, legitimate, sanctioned ritual. So we immediately see this very complicated uh, dichotomy between Magia as illegitimate ritual and then anthropologists and historians who want to use magic as a category that we can use in anthropological study. And some, some academics are like, you know what, this term is just too, too messy. It's too wrapped up with ancient prejudice that it's really not that useful of a term. I still wrestle with this myself. I try to use terms that are much more precise. Okay, we have rituals for cursing. We have rituals for protection. We have rituals for healing. And sometimes they look like an amulet. Sometimes they look like somebody touching you. You know, like a lot of Jesus's healings take place with just laying on of hands. And these all are under the bucket of uh, healing rituals. Um, as soon as you bring out that word magic, though, it's like, okay, we're not talking about magia, though. Every time you translate magia as magic, I think you're making a bad translation because you are not bringing all of that value-laden pejorative connotations into play. I, I try to translate it as sorcery because even today in the 21st century, when we say sorcery, we mean Voldemort. We don't mean Harry Potter. You know, we mean, we mean the bad, the bad ritual. This is fascinating. I, I almost felt like with John of Chrysostom while you were saying that, it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then cognitive dissonance sets in. I see the same problem, you know. Oftentimes, you can watch people of certain faiths go and see the other positions and go, how ridiculous. You need to be washed by the blood of Jesus. Duh. And it's like, um, my friend, I was with you. And then you kind of, I had to stop at this point. But I, I, I'm not here to be uh, anti-religious. I just figured it's a funny kind of an anachronism because you're thinking, John's kind of enlightened here. Here's a rational man. And then, oh, so it's really us versus them ideas. Um, I want to take a quick second for everybody. You just did a video on your your uh, YouTube channel about magic. Jesus, the magician, in fact. Can you tell us a little bit about this video that you did? Sure. So I I, I kind of touch on the same question that Morton Smith addresses. So in the late 70s, Morton Smith, who was an ancient historian, published, published a book called Jesus the Magician. And he argues basically that Jesus was a magician. Part of his argument is that if you look at the what he considers the earliest layers of the gospel, you see hints of a Jesus that was primarily a miracle worker, primarily an exorcist. And the stories that portray him as a rabbi and as a teacher are later additions. And he makes this argument that there was this um, kind of vanguard defense to try to repaint Jesus as more of a well-rounded rabbi and teacher and not just a miracle worker, because that kind of trope of being a miracle worker is too easily thrown into that bucket of magia and being a magus. Um, he uses examples like Celsus, so the, the Greek uh, philosopher in the second century who portrays Jesus as a magician and as, a, as a, somebody that's possessed by demons and works by demons. Um, Morton Smith points at ideas, uh, examples like the so-called Beelzebul accusation. So in the Gospels, Jesus is accused of casting out demons by the power of the king of demons, Beelzebul. And that's, he's like, this shows that right during his ministry, he was being accused of this. Uh, and, and then he makes this argument that Jesus was a, a magician. Um, I, I guess we can get into it right now. But my, my concern with Morton Smith, let's, let's start with what I agree with. What I agree with is that there is evidence of kind of a counter narrative in the Gospels. There does seem to be, you know, the Gospel writers seem to be responding to accusations leveraged against Jesus. I, I would say most New Testament scholars tend to agree that the Beelzebul accusation is historical, that Jesus must have been accused of this. Uh, which would imply he might have been doing some sort of exorcist or at least was accused of being some sort of cheap trickster, charlatan, magus, magus. Um, and, and another great example is there are two miracles where Jesus uses spit. There's this in the, in the Gospel of Mark where there's a blind man in the town of Bethsaida who comes out to Jesus and they're like, hey, heal, heal this blind guy. So Jesus spits, puts some mud together with the spit, puts it on the guy's eye. 
and it only heals him halfway. Jesus is like, oh, can you see? And the guy's like, well, not really. The people look like they're walking around like trees. So Jesus tries again. And it's kind of this gritty, literally earthy ritual. It's kind of gross. And it doesn't sound like the sort of miracles we usually see in the Gospels. Jesus usually says something authoritatively and stuff happens. You know, peace be still and the Sea of Galilee stops. He touches people. They, they're healed. Why does he need to use spit and mud? And lo and behold, Matthew and Luke, which most scholars agree were written later and incorporated a bunch of Mark into their gospel narratives, cut out the spit and mud miracles. Why would they do that? Uh, Mark Goodacre, the, the, the New Testament scholar, uh, who I, I think you've had on the show before, or at least I've heard you talk about him. Uh, Mark Goodacre says it's because, you know, Matthew was kind of grossed out by this ritual and he, or the story. And he wanted Jesus to be more divine, more ethereal, you know, not so gritty as using spit and mud in your miracles. So there's, insofar as Morton Smith argues that there's this counter narrative of Jesus, of Jesus being accused of certain things, we can kind of read between the lines that, okay, there was this effort to try to make Jesus seem a little more refined in the later gospels. Another thing I agree with Morton Smith is that there's really, what, what's the difference between a miracle and a, and a, and a work of magic? Uh, it, if, you're, if we're trying to use the word magic in a very anthropological sense, you know, I, I use the, the example of Jedi in Star Wars as, a, as an example, because they, they do things that are unexplainable, like jumping really high, running really fast, making things float. Uh, and then the bad guy, the Sith, do the exact same thing. So for one's illegitimate and one's legitimate, one's evil, one's not, but functionally they don't look any different. So when you look at like early apocryphal acts with Simon Magus, Simon Magus does miracles. He starts flying. He, he creates, um, he has like uh, demons come do his bidding and he kind of does it just by saying it in the same way that Jesus just says stuff and it happens. So functionally there's no real difference. It's, it's a speech act that's done in the moment, or it's a gesture like touching somebody. But for Simon Magus, that's evil. For Jesus, it's not. One's magic, one's miracle. And Morton Smith is like, okay, these are more, these are, these are not anthropological terms. They're actually kind of value-laden terms tied up with our own preconceptions of what we think a work of wonder working should look like. Um, so I use this term thaumaturgical performance instead of miracle or, or magic. Thaumaturgy just me, meaning wonder working. It's just a very boring academic way to say something that is very uncanny, very supernatural, very unexplainable. Uh, Simon Magus does thaumaturgy. Jesus does thaumaturgy. Some people call that magic. Some people call that miracle, depending on your own biases. So those two things in particular, there's a counter narrative that we can kind of read and kind of glean through the Gospels. Uh, and the difference between magic and miracle is is subjective are two things that I would agree with Martin Smith. I really like how you kind of took it out and then parsed it like that so people can really get a grasp of what you're trying to say. Um, as far as this idea of they're doing some type of miracle working, I know we can't, we don't have a time machine. We can't see what they were really probably doing. But when I look at modern examples in the third world countries that are kind of like duping many believers. I think they're duping a lot of them, using these things to take advantage of people, to control people, you name it. If we were to, let's say we're taking a completely natural approach here, a historical methodology, you can't prove a miracle, yeah. right? So we go back um, and we're looking at what may have been going on on the ground to some degree. Maybe Jesus isn't the best example, but we can look at surrounding examples that aren't so theological and protected by the bubble of religious uh, zealous people. Um, what would you think we're looking at? I mean, we see people yeah. in third world countries. For example, I've been told, let me use one example. Jesus turns water into wine. I personally read that and see that more literary, even though there may have been jars with multiple compartments in it where they had holes they could cover and <laughs> they could pour out water and then in a second they could pour out wine. Yeah. I mean, you could, you could invent some sort of way that it could have been done. Right. Uh, I, yeah. I just think that's more literary in John. And I think it's probably something of a jab at Dionysian concepts, in my opinion. But, but uh, either way, I, I think Dennis McDonald's probably onto something there in the Gospel of John on this whole Euripides and other things. Um, but, you know, what are we looking at? Is Are these people like what we're seeing in third world countries who are kind of getting really superstitious people or 
maybe that's a bad way of putting it, but like these people who are prone to, they want to believe in something beyond and they don't understand rational thought the way that people with education do. What do you, what do you think is going on with Jesus and these other people? Yeah. And I, I don't think we need to look to developing nations for examples. Like look at exorcism, exorcisms in the United States, look at faith healers in the United States. Uh, there's this, uh, I think his name is Bob Larson or something. He's a YouTuber who does public exorcisms and then post videos of it. And he's just doing the, I don't know where he is, but he's in the U S somewhere. Um, I think that's something that might point to like what Jesus might've been doing, you know, these public faith healings. Uh, and, it, and it's a very social psychological experience. Like, I don't think these, like he might, this Bob Larson fellow, he might be a charlatan, but I don't think every Christian doing exorcists in the United States or elsewhere are charlatans necessarily. You know, they believe demons exist. They believe demons can possess you. And you kind of got this social psychological experience in the in the church, like, okay, we know how we should act when demons are around, we should know what we should say. So uh, the sociologist Pierre Bourdieu calls this um, habitus, you know, we know the habit, we know how to we know how to act, because we've kind of had this shared sense of how we should treat demons because of our religious beliefs, because of our religious texts, and there's so much into that. Um, what I would say in brief is that magician is not a social category in the Greco-Roman period, at least in an anthropological sense. If you go back in time with a, with to interview some Greco-Roman person, nobody's out there calling themselves a magician. There are people out there that are scribes that make magical texts like the Greek magical papyri. There are you know, amulet workers and metal smiths that create amulets out of metal, out of bronze, out of silver. Um, there are gem workers. So some of the coolest objects and the ritual objects from the Greco-Roman period are these, these magic gems. They're like tiny, they're super small with these highly intricate drawings of Canubis or other, other Greco-Roman deities that you would have worn as on a ring or on a necklace or in your pocket. And that's not an easy thing to make. That is a highly specialized, th those are created by highly specialized workshops. So this bifurcation between like the educated masses or the uneducated masses and the educated masses, like that's not happening at least in antiquity because you have these highly uh, skilled craftsmen making these objects. And so let's use an example. One of my favorite amulets I call the Alexandra amulet. It dates to about the fourth century. It's from Lebanon. So modern day Beirut is where it was discovered. And it's, it's very lengthy. It's this 37 centimeter long piece of silver. And you can see creases on the silver. So we know it was rolled up. My, my hunch is it was rolled up and put into like a little casket that was around your necklace. Because we, we see examples of this from the Greco-Roman period. And it says something along the lines of protect Alexandra whom Zoe bore. Protect her from demons and sorcery and dizziness. Uh, and then it very interestingly says protect her from male demons so like it, to me, it's kind of the sexualized uh, amulet that I believe two parents bought for their daughter, Alexandra. So maybe a teenage daughter, protect her from sexual advances, protect her from uh, curse tablets that uses the term uh, binding spells, which are these lead curse tablets that the Greeks and the Romans used. And then it lists like 25 archangels, you know, by the power of so-and-so protect Alexandra by the power of so-and-so, then 25 angels. Then it says by the power of Lord Sabaoth, the God of Isaac and Abraham and Jacob, protect Alexandra. So who in fourth century Eastern Mediterranean cities knew 25 archangels off the top of their head? You know, somebody that's highly literate, probably a priest, monk, bishop. You know, who knows liturgical phrases like the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, bishops, priests, monks. I believe that the formula was created by some sort of Christian functionary, religious functionary, probably some sort of monk or bishop. And the the metal itself is this highly, it's expensive, it's silver. So this is not some like poor uh, person that's just like scraping together like some sort of wax or papyrus amulet, which we also see. It's like this, it's like this family heirloom almost. Um, probably made by a silversmith. So you see like a, a marketplace, we could call it like a magical marketplace that required some sort of religious functionary, probably some sort of Christian priest, some sort of silver worker, and then two wealthy parents who wanted to buy the ultimate protective amulet for their daughter. So the, n n nothing in that description of this object has to do with magician. We have a priest, we have a silver worker, and we have a wealthy couple one of which is named Zoe, whom Alexandra bore.
So when I say that magician is not a social role in antiquity, I'm saying it's not a job title. The job title of people who did magic back then was scribe, priest, rabbi, um, and so forth. So they're like actual social roles, and some of which required a bunch of training. And when we, when we deploy the word ma magic or magician, I'm afraid that we're dipping into the world of folklore and not the world of anthropology. So we do have folkloric people like Medea, uh, and you know who who kills Jason's sons and in, in Greek mythology, people like Circe who turns Odysseus and his crew into pigs. Like these are like sorceresses. Like they, we could use the word magicians for them, but they're not real people. You know, they're literary figures versus this very real person who sat down and made a silver amulet for Alexandra, who never once would have said, "I am doing magia right now," but I'm protecting her from magia. You know, even though it's a magical object, an amulet. It, it's. Hmm. There's so many things to kind of dig into here that I find fascinating about what you said. Um, my exploration in the Gospels and researching like Dennis McDonald and other academics who take this Homeric Greek approach and saying these authors are highly literate to learn Greek. They had to be taught. Uh, they knew Homer. They knew these things, not only from the literate <clears throat> approach, but in society at large and the plays and the acts. And so they're probably aware of this. And like you said, with Circe turning the men into pigs, I've seen him make an interesting case that Jesus obviously casting out these demons or by the, the man, um, Mount Ger no, Mount Gerizim, almost Mount Gerizim, <laughs> the, the uh, demoniac at um, Gerasa. Gerasim. Yeah. 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 I, I, am I even saying that right? I keep uh, getting the name I, there wrong. You know who I'm talking about. The, the yeah, guy no, cutting himself. Like the, the, the legion, yeah. Yeah, so he cast the demons into the pigs, and of course the pigs run into the water. That There's probably some literary um, mimesis here. And yeah. it makes me wonder if when Morton Smith was writing his book, that was he factoring in this is probably literary and not actually happening on the ground? Rather than being, it almost seems like his approach was somewhat of a rationalist approach. Mm. Whereas we're dealing with folklore in a sense or legend. Yeah. And so yeah. is that fine line between legend and w this amulet, to use your analogy, like Jesus would have been a real guy who would have been really probably doing stuff like the amulet concept. But the, the trope, the written text that we have is more in the line of legend and folklore in a sense, I guess, to yeah. use it analogy yeah I, I would agree with you he goes out of his way to make many different scenes in the gospel narratives be magical like he uh, i use the term parallelomania like he's just finding parallels everywhere uh in, in a way that i find kind of sloppy so so let's switch to how i view uh the, the things i disagree with morton smith um I, I view him as being kind of sloppy with both theory and method so in academics, theory refers to being really precise with your concepts and your definitions. You know, what do you mean by magic? What do you mean by religion? If you're doing a, a work on, I don't know, some sort of gospel genre, you'd be very precise about what do you mean by biography? Like it's, it's sometimes the most boring part of an academic work, but it's one of the most important parts. Morton Smith constantly elides or uh, casually s switches between magia and the English word magic. The, the Greek word magus and the English word magician just constantly switches between the two in, in a way that I find casual and a way that I find a little bit irresponsible because, you know, the Greek magical papyri, no Egyptian priest would have said, hey, I'm doing magia right now. It's we modern people calling those magical papyri. Uh, it's it, it, even things like translating certain words in a more magical sense could could throw off our analysis. So you have the Greek word praxis, which just means procedure. And some of these historians throughout the 20th century were translating that as spell. Here's the spell. Here's the praxis. And it's just procedure. So as soon as you use that word spell, you are <laughs> you are biasing your audience. So he he goes out of his way to 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 use the word magician even though he should be very careful about using the word untranslated in my opinion, magia or magus. Um the other problem is with his method. So method just refers to the, the techniques that you use, the tools that you bring to the data. Are you translating an ancient text? Are you analyzing an ancient object? Um, so the problem with method, let's turn to the Greek magical papyri. So the Greek magical papyri, the Greek magical papyri are a collection of texts from Greco-Roman Egypt 
dating from the Ptolemaic period, so 100 BCE, when Egypt was ruled by Ptolemy, you know, the Ptolemy dynasty, which followed Alexander the Great after Alexander conquered Egypt, all the way up to like the fourth and fifth centuries. So like really late, really late Roman Empire. And Morton Smith will do things like the baptism of Jesus was a magical performance. You know, this is when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, the dove comes down and settles on Jesus, and, you know, God proclaims Jesus his, his chosen one, you know? And he says, this is a magical performance. For proof, let me show you an example of a bird coming down from heaven from the Greek magical papyri. <clears throat> and I look into it, and the one example he uses is called Greek magical papyrus 1, PGM 1. And it dates to the third century. It's like 200 years after Jesus. That, <clears throat> that is written by, sorry, I'm really <laughs> losing my voice here. <clears throat> so PGM1, it's a third century text written by an Egyptian priest down in Thebes. So hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the Galilee and 200 years after Jesus's life. That would be like saying, you know, Shakespeare was influenced by, you know, French playwrights. For an example, here's a French playwright from the 1900s, you know, hundreds of years after Shakespeare. And you're like, <laughs> how, does that, how does that work? You're like retrojecting this 18th century text back to 16th century literature <clears throat> in two different countries. So then on the next page, he's like, here's another example from PGM4. PGM4 is called The Great Magical Papyrus of Paris. It's this huge handbook, again, written by an Egyptian priest that dates to the fourth century. So an additional century after Jesus and a century after PGM-1. So in, within two pages, he's like, here's my proof, a third century Egyptian text and a fourth century Egyptian text that are both centuries after Jesus, who was a first century Galilean uh, you know, preacher slash wonder worker, possibly. And I, I think that's bad methodology. That's just like using the wrong texts and the wrong data to kind of prove your point. You know, look, look for data from first century Judean practice to try to figure out what Jesus might have been doing. So sloppy theory, sloppy method. I think it, I, my, my opinion, and this is pretty harsh, I think every single time you see him mention the, <clears throat> the magical papyri, just ignore it. It's just, it's just very sloppy. But it, would you admit that there's probably a similarity to the to the idea in the magical papyri? But would you say maybe it had its influence by then <clears throat> from Christianity at this point? So really, like I, I I really like what you're saying here because it everyone likes to who is critical of Christianity likes to say Christianity borrowed from everybody else and they learned all their stuff from everybody else, and we know that's not true in in many respects. I'm not saying first century Christianity did not have stuff it used and borrowed. Sure. Um, but I'm saying like things went all directions and Christianity made a huge impact. So by the third and fourth century to pretend that this magical papyri didn't have influence probably from Christianity, or we can't verify that, but it may look like Christian ideas in some sense. Who's to say this isn't later like you're saying. And really it was, it was uh, Shakespeare who influenced the 19th century writing or whatever. So is there something contemporaneous to Christianity that helps us better nail down what is happening? Is uh, That's the difficult part, getting back to the text and the reality, the amulet versus casting demons into pigs. Is there anything like the spitting in the mud kind of puts a historical root there for what Jesus would have actually been. Uh, was he a healer type or is that all part of the literary stuff? Do you think this guy was running around kind of like what we're seeing as descriptions of Vespasian in the Serapian temple by Tacitus? And he's like, he literally stepped on a withered man's hand and, and cured him. And then another one, he spits in the guy's eyes. If I'm not mistaken, in his eyes or in his hand, but I think it was in his eyes directly or something. The guy could see all of a sudden. What in your research has kind of been your conclusion? Have you been drawn more toward the literary? As these are like accolades saying, this guy, you know, he's <laughs> he walked on water, man, you know? Yeah. What do you think's happening? 
I, I think it, overwhelmingly I would be on the literary side. I mean, first and foremost, this is where you, you interviewed uh, Robin Faith Walsh on your channel a few a few months ago, who has this wonderful book on the origins of early Christian literature. She makes this argument that the Gospels are subversive biographies. They're meant to show and portray Jesus as a subversive figure who can stand up to the Pharisees. He can stand up to the Sadducees. He can stand up to the Romans. Like that's the goal of the Gospels to kind of you know, heroize and lionize Jesus. And so the vast majority of the miracles, I think, are, are literary stories. Um, I guess the, there's this little part of me that thinks, you know, it's very plausible for him to have been this itinerant exorcist because we do see some relatively contemporaneous sources that talk about Jewish exorcists. There's this famous scene in Josephus where there's this Jewish exorcist in the court of Vespasian uh, exorcising a demon from a man with a Solomonic ring. And it says like he has the ring under the guy's nostrils and like draws out the demon, which I think is just so visceral and like very believable because there's so much Solomonic magic. There, there are so many rings, you know, that were meant to protect or to, you know, somehow leverage ritual power. So that's very believable. Um, and then you also have some exorcisms from the, the Dead Sea Scrolls that use uh, Psalms. Psalm 91 is this very famous uh, Psalm that's like, that talks about dwelling in the defense of you know god the almighty like it's this very d defensive protective sounding psalm which appears on amulets well into the byzantine period so you have these at least in the christian era like christians would take um they look kind of like bronze coins and then have psalm 91 inscribed around the circumference of the coin and then they would have like a little perforated hole that you could wear as a necklace so psalm 91 is, like, is the ultimate anti-demon formula from Second Temple period Judaism all the way through late Roman Christianity. And you also have other Psalms from from the Dead Sea Scrolls that are basically like <clears throat> talking about keeping demons out of you. So like was that you can you can say with confidence that there was a robust world of Jewish exorcism in the first century. Can we then make the next jump and say, therefore, Jesus was doing exorcists, exorcisms like I, you know, I, I kind of punt on the issue. I think the the strongest evidence would be the Beelzebul accusation like it is this kind of strident accusation that jesus is filled with a demon and he exercises by the power of demons so if you say okay that's a legitimate accusation that was leveraged against him during his lifetime okay maybe he was during, doing exorcisms but i i think that's that's i think one step beyond that i'm comfortable saying was definitely happening but i think it's plausible yeah i think there's a plausibility as well like i've heard I don't know if it's the Tsefta or not. One of the Jewish writings earlier, of course, than the Talmud, which would be late in the game. Here we are again de dealing with later stuff. But Using a really late text to retro. Every you know, I sometimes mention the Talmud as evidence too. But like, I always am like, but this is not firm evidence. If we're talking about second or first century Judaism, okay, this might be helpful. But if this is a seventh century invention or a sixth century invention, then this is not useful data. And that's the that's one of the things I always want to say is be cautious. But if we're trying to play, you know, with with blindfolds on in a sense and figure out and guess, there's supposedly uh, Dr. James D. Tabor told me that there were Jews casting out demons in the name of a man named uh, actually Yeshua Ben Pantera, like literally Jesus, son of Panther, if you will, and. It wasn't done in a pejorative sense. So he said, like, you'll find mostly uh, pejorative terms used for this. Uh, he's the son of the panther, you know, and, and he doesn't think it's Parthenon, a play on the term Parthenon for virgin. He thinks this is probably a guy that they might be mocking later. But early on, it's not used in a derogatory sense, he said in some of his writings. And they're casting out demons in his name. And one of the people died uh, in one of these texts, something like that. Uh, anyway, I'm ignorant on the, the source. I just wanted to bring it out. Like maybe there were these practices going on and the gospels do have that situation where there's even supposedly Pharisees running around, like cast out demons in the name of Jesus and stuff. And um, now I think that's more literary when it talks about, we know who he is, but who are you? You know, like, yeah, obviously. Yeah. We see that in the book of Acts, the, the sons of Sceva were exercising in the name of Jesus, which I think, Again, I don't know if the sons of Sceva are historical, but it's it's definitely, I think it's very likely that within a hundred years after Jesus, maybe even less, people were using him as an exorcistic phrase. And this we do see in the Greek, the Greek magical papyri. There are at, there's at least one formula in the Greek magical papyri that 
call that use the name of Jesus. And it's kind of funny. They say by the power of Jesus, the God of the Hebrews, you know, to, 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 as an anti-demon formula. Uh, th this is from the, the great magic papyrus of Py uh, Paris that I mentioned before. Um, it dates to the fourth century. So it's very late. And, and it's kind of this very syncretized uh, text that draws on Jewish and Christian and pagan imagery and puts it into one exorcistic formula. But you can, it's, it's kind of interesting to see by fourth century, by the fourth century, some Egyptian priest was like, ah, Jesus, that's a name that I know. And that's a name I need to put into my exorcistic spell. So I, I think at least the Sons of Sceva story is very plausible, uh, even though these are separated. You know, that's probably a first or second century story versus the great magical papyrus of Paris, which is fourth century. But, you know, Jesus becomes kind of a exorcistic name that you could use. It reminds me of uh, that movie Mummy. When the God that comes to life, it's like evil, finds one of the priest guys who has like 20 different you know, ambulance on him and then he pulls out one. Hey, is it this? Is it, is it that? Like he's calling on these gods and different things. Um, anyway, I was going to ask you, let's get into a little bit of the art, if you don't mind. There are supposedly early depictions. Some of the earliest depictions of Jesus, he has a wand. I mean, he like we yeah. think of magic, right? We think of yeah. wand, wizard. I know mm -hmm. magic, as you've spent most of this episode saying like, let's get the term out of our heads. Yeah. It's difficult because we watch Wizard of Oz or we watch um we watch Lord of the Rings and here is you know Gandalf and he has powers yeah. and things. But why do they have Jesus with a with a wand or a stick in many cases? Yeah, no, it's it's extremely interesting. And it's it's just very short object. It's not like this huge staff. I think a lot of academics do use the word staff instead of wand because that word wand just brings <clears throat> it I don't think they're they're being squeamish. I think they're like we're trying to avoid these these kind of simplistic connotations um but yeah i would call those depictions of the miracle work in jesus there's kind of different tropes of early christian art you have jesus the like the the pentocrator like the all powerful ruler of the universe jesus he has a big beard he looks kind of like zeus or you know other other gods that are portrayed kind of big bearded sitting on a throne you have jesus the philosopher he's kind of dressed as a philosopher sometimes with his hand up as if he's teaching and then you have Jesus, the wonder worker, who is frequently portrayed holding a stick of some sort, you know, pointing at the bread and the fish as he turns them into, you know, uh, you know to multiply them. He's pointing at the tomb with Lazarus walking out. Um, it's tricky because Moses is also depicted in a similar manner. So I, some scholars argue that this is actually making him in, in the mold of Moses and not so much a magician or a magus. Uh, the thing is, though, Moses was also kind of <laughs> sometimes thought of as a magical figure. So, um, again, you know, I, I I wouldn't necessarily say it's a magic wand. I would say it's it's definitely it, it's it's building it's it's going out, outside of the Gospels. You know, he's not portrayed having a stick in the Gospels. So it's some sort of ritual object that accompanies his his miracles. Um, the thing is, like, not every folkloric sorcerer in Greco Roman literature is using a wand you know Circe, Circe has some sort of uh, uh, stick uh, I believe Hermes does as well so like it, it is this this trope uh, and I, I guess it if, if I had to make an argument I would say it's the the greco-roman artists drawing on what they know so okay he's a wonder worker what do wonder workers do well many of them have a stick um, you know, I guess I, I have not done the actual research to, to see what does like the, the development of the magic wand look like. When we say wand here in the 21st century, we think of Harry Potter. We think of like energy blasting out of it. Um, I'm not exactly sure what a Greek or a Roman or a you know Jew in the Second Temple period would say about the stick. Like, is it augmenting his power like in Harry Potter? Is is it the thing that actually affects the ritual, actualizes the ritual? Um, I don't know, but it definitely puts him in this mold of wonder worker and not so much as a philosopher or a, a god, really. It's more like a, a wonder working uh, figure. Do you find that more in this time period in the first century that more people from the Galilee were wonder worker types? I mean, we know Honey, for example, uh, interesting. Are there any other examples like Honey or maybe you want to draw on Honey? that we could relate to Jesus to try and draw information to understand maybe about a historical Jesus. Yeah. 
I mean, there's not that much. I know Honey the Circle Maker is kind of the is the big example. Um, I think Apollonius is sometimes mentioned, but I I think it, I, I have not really done the, the research necessary for this. I believe he's later, you know, like second century text, third century text. So I'm a little more hesitant with with drawing stark parallels. But um, the closest parallel for me would be the Eleazar figure from Josephus, who who must like his role. This guy must have been an official exorcist. Um, I, I forget who who made this argument. There was a recent dissertation basically saying that Jewish exorcism in the first century was also a highly specialized literate uh, trade. So he's actually a little bit. He, 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 I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but this this dissertation basically argued against Jesus being historically an exorcist because it doesn't seem that he would have had the necessary education to be an exorcist. I don't know if I buy that so much because I don't know if it requires that much. I think it requires mostly charisma <laughs> to stand on stage and say, you know, charisma and authority. I am casting out this demon. Um, but at least the exorcistic formulas we see from the Dead Sea Scrolls are works of literature by literate specialists. So the it, it's tricky. I, I think the whoever made those exorcistic formulas in the Dead Sea Scrolls is not the same sort of social figure as Jesus. From what we can tell, Jesus is this, uh, you know, rural, living in this less developed area, doing a faith healing of some sort. So these public exorcisms and doesn't seem to be using formulas. And then versus this person living in the Judean desert at the, at the Qumran community who makes exorcistic formulas on papyrus uh, or parchment. Um, it's 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 just like a, a different type of exorcism, different type type of different. You know, these are different classes of specialist, even though they're doing the same thing, which is defending against demonic power. There's so many interesting things to dive into. So I wanted to pick your brain as we're as we're wrapping things up here on the magic and and dealing with Morton Smith's arguments, and of course where you have studied and looked at these magical papyri and said. Late in the game, do not take those to the bank. It's still interesting to learn, but don't make an argument that Morton Smith was making there about this correlation. Um, as far as scholarship goes, this is kind of getting off the track of magic, but more into New Testament studies. I've noticed you've done a lot of work with understanding Mark's our earliest gospel, going to Mark Goodacre, of course, Ian Mills, who's now PhD. Uh, he he's awesome, by the way. A, a wonderful scholars that you've been working with, and I wanted to get your thoughts just to get where you're coming from. What you think is happening? You, you mentioned Robin Faith Walsh, which I'm already like, oh, awesome, awesome. So he's seen my interview with her, and he's probably read her works and things like that. What do you think? Where do you think scholarship's heading right now as a scholar in the field? Who's like, you know, you have a special um, skill set. It's not just that you're specialized. You're trained to know how to do good scholarship. Unlike me, I'm not saying I don't know how to do some, but like I'm not trained to do it. What direction do you think is going on in the, in New Testament studies in the correct path? Do you think finding out that maybe Roman elites or elites in some sense, whether Roman or Jewish doesn't matter, highly educated people are writing these competitive gospels? Um, we're we're heading in the right path in what we're doing right now, like. The Paul within Judaism school, do you think they're on the right path, like heading in that direction rather than Paul was against Torah completely? And what do you, where are you at in the New Testament? Yeah. I mean, I will say that the New Testament's slightly outside my, my field. I do late Roman stuff. You know, I'm really comfortable in the third to sixth centuries. First and second century, you know, I'm a little bit, a little bit more hazy. Um, I will say, you know, as someone who does late antiquity and not second temple Judaism, I am happy to see New Testament scholars catching up to what late antique historians have been doing for decades, which is focusing more on the materiality. You know, we, we talk about these gospel, you know, fragments of gospels from the sands of Egypt. And we, we, so many people think of them as literary texts. Oh, what kind of, what can the, what can we learn from the words written on this piece of papyrus? And I'm like, that's also a object. That's a piece of papyrus. Can we figure out how that was used ritually in third century Egypt, you know, how a Christian was standing in a basilica with this gospel codex, how was it being used? So I'm, I'm, I'm noticing New Testament scholarship starting to pay attention to materiality. I'm starting them to pay a little bit more attention to like sociological and anthropological theory, which I appreciate. 
This is thinking about, you know, social roles. Uh, this is where Robin Faith Walsh is like, what is the social uh, location of the Gospels? Well, it must have been super elite Greek and Roman authors. Like, we're not even talking about the 1%. We're talking about the zero, you know, the 0.01% of Greco-Roman uh, elite. So, these are like highly elite uh works of literature. So paying attention to social theories, paying attention to anthropology. Um, this is something that archaeologists have been very good at. This is something that historians have been pretty good at. And I, I've always noticed a little bit of that uh, you kind of had to drag the New Testament scholars along. Hey, let's let's pay attention to the materiality. Let's pay attention to yes. sociology and anthropology. Uh, and this is why I love religious studies so much as a discipline, because if you get your PhD in religious studies, you're just, it just hammered into you from day one. Um, versus some of these other programs that might you, you'll be diving into the text right away, but are you diving into the the, the ritual practice? Um, so that, that's my hope for the f the future, and I, I do see uh, movements in that direction. I love how you you put that. I, it makes me wonder. Just to throw the question at you, I'm going to be interviewing one of her dear friends who wrote a commentary on Matthew, and I heard her, and I'll leave her name unnamed right now until I interview her. She said that it wouldn't shock her if Matthew's gospel was written by someone on par with Tacitus. I mean, meaning like that kind of elite. And I'm thinking to myself, there's this Roman provenance theory. I know that it's filled and laden with conspiracy. I get it. You know, uh, Vespasian, uh, you know, sent down a decree secretly, uh, write these, uh, infiltrating propagandistic, uh, books to infiltrate the rebel movement from continuing in their ideology of being zealous and whatnot. Like there's conspiracy theories, mm. but it makes me wonder, we have the ground up model grassroots movement turning into a Roman Imperial type of thing over time. That's where I'm at right now. But these gospels do kind of throw a wild, what the heck? Not very long after the movement is started, 30, 40 years, you have these extremely well sophisticated documents being written, we call gospels, and they're not like just some guy writing these texts. It seems to be very educated people writing it. Do you think this gives some room for, for the people who think maybe Rome is involved uh, more than we think? Yeah. I, I don't know enough th about the scholarship to make a really educated guess. Um, I, I would not be surprised to hear that that p comparison between Matthew and Tacitus. I mean, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, these are impressive texts. And I feel like studying magic kind of has given me an idea of what less impressive texts look like. Uh, there's this this great collection of cursed tablets discovered in England that date to like the second and third centuries. And some of the and they're all written on lead. They're all calling upon the goddess Sulis Minerva to protect protect you. It's actually most of them is, is to fix petty crime. So and so stole my hooded cloak. Please bring the hooded cloak back to the temple. So it's almost like this bulletin board, and like may Sulis Minerva destroy you and your family if you don't. <laughs> and some of them are written in like extremely messy handwriting, spelling errors. So obviously, some Joe Schmo just did that himself, and he's like, somebody stole my my hoodie from, I mean, and literally hooded cloaks. A lot of hooded cloaks are being stolen from this bathhouse in third century England. Uh, and then there's other ones that are like an extremely beautiful Latin script. So my theory is that some of these were self-made. Some of them were made by the temple priests who are like, hey, let me help you with that cursed tablet. Uh, same with papyrus from Egypt. Some are just short little letters with messy handwriting, spelling errors, and some are, you know, copies of Plato's Republic, like what was found in the Nag Hammadi codices. So you can kind of get a sense of like what level of education was necessary to produce some of these texts. Um, either we're, whether we're talking about the gospel, the gospels like the gospel of Matthew, or if we're talking about the great magical papyrus of, per of Paris, which is like this massive handbook written by an extremely literate priest, if not several, like entire, uh, you know, the entire uh, priest or temple uh, priesthood compiling this handbook of different formulas. Hey, I'm going to throw in this exorcism that mentions Jesus. I'm going to throw in this formula that says, help me with my migraine headache. Oh, I'm also going to throw in this massive Mithras liturgy, like really literate stuff. Um, so we're, when, when we think of a magician in antiquity, it's not like, it's not just the, the shaman on the side of the road trying to help your baby die, not die from dysentery. It's also like highly 
specialized Egyptian priests that knew the Greek gods, who, who knew enough to, to, to throw in Jesus into their exorcism. And, and I, I think we're looking at that level of expertise for the, the Gospels as well. One last final question about this. Being someone who specializes in the 3rd to 6th century AD, I know I keep harping back toward the 1st century, but I always like to try and understand this religion that had its claws so deeply in me. And what is it? What is going on here? I did a seven-part series that hasn't been launched yet with M. David Litwa. Um, and he's talking about mystery cults, mystery religion, however you want to call it. And he said uh, he's, he did seven of them, the Eleusinian, the I Isis Osiris. He did all these different things. And he finally, on the seventh one, he did Christianity. Hmm. And in all of them, he wanted to kind of show there's a lot in common in Paul with mystery cults and stuff. But getting into this Mithras liturgy and someone who specializes later on and trying to understand it, do you think that uh, early on, because we don't have much kind of a lacuna in, in the field of Mithras, there's some borrowing or is that, that's probably a bad term to use because I know a lot of scholars like to make sure that they don't have parallelomania. But do you think there's something going on in the ritual itself that has a common trope in Mithras as with Jesus? I guess the way I would put it is that, you know, Mithraists and early Christians were swimming in the same cultural waters, and that includes how they do ritual. So, you know, for example, if today in this day and age we say, oh, Christians meet in churches and Muslims meet in mosques, like, is there borrowing there? I'm like, well, no, they're just in these two religions, they meet in buildings. Some religions, you don't meet in buildings. <laughs> so like when I see that the Mithraists were meeting in Mithraea, so these underground rooms, uh, the Christians were meeting in houses. And at least with the Dura Europus church, it's like this, this house that's been converted into a ritual space. Uh, that's not surprising to me to have initiation rituals like baptism versus the Mithraists who had a very complicated initiation ritual. I see similarities there. I wouldn't say they're borrowing from each other, but I would say the Greeks and the Romans had initiation rituals and that's just how they did religion. Um, so, so for me, it's, it's not so much borrowing as much as it's like they're drawing from their culture. So even things like, um, like the, the Christian phrase, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy is drawn from imperial language where you refer to the emperor as Kyrie. Um, the, the Trisagion, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, is drawing from Jewish liturgy that stretches back before Christianity. So there is, there is borrowing that happens. And when I look for that borrowing, I try to look for like very obvious lines of influence. And those examples seem pretty obvious to me. Um, yeah. Is it fair to say by the third, sixth century, the lines have become blurred? I mean, they're already blurry in the first, but I'm saying you, even Litwa says, go to the second century. Stop trying mm -hmm. to act like you know what happened in the first because he said, it's a wild, wild west. And then he said, even in the second century, it's a wild, wild west. Like So, yeah. so understanding what happened in the first is, in Christianity or in what we like to call Christianity, which wasn't really Christianity. Uh, I would say it's still a wild west, even in the fourth and fifth centuries. So John wow. Chrysostom complains about Christians attending synagogues, complaining to his own congregation, "Hey, stop going to synagogues." <laughs> so, like, we think about Christianity and Judaism split, you know, parting ways sometime in the first or second century. I'm like, well, there were still Christians going to synagogues in the fourth century, and Chrysostom lived into the fifth century. So we're talking like well after Constantine, there is still a, a type of Christian out there who apparently still affiliated with Judaism which is very interesting. Uh, he complains about, like I said, people relying on um, amulets that, are, that have Alexander the Great. The, uh, there's a bishop in southern France called Caesarius who complains about his parishioners going to sacred groves, like going out to trees on, in, the, in the countryside. And as Caesarius, I think, is 5th or 6th century. So he's like really late. <laughs> you know, some people don't even use the Roman Empire anymore. They use the word Byzantine Empire by then. But the people, there were still Christians going out into the countryside to sacred groves. Um, so to use that term habitus again, there's like the, 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 the idea, like the, the deeply culturally ingrained rituals that people do are so ingrained that they kind of happen 
in the background. It's like the software on your phone. You don't really know that it's there. You just see what pops up on your screen. And everything from Christians going to saint shrines and sleeping there overnight to have a saint visit them and heal them. Well, that sounds a lot like Asclepius. You go sleep in the temple of Asclepius and Asclepius will visit you in your dreams and heal you. So that's a practice that continued from the you know Greek period, hundreds of years before Christianity and way into the Christian period. Uh, the, there's, there's something called ticket oracles in Egypt where you'd write a question on a little ticket. Hey, should I move to Chicago? Yes or no? You fold up the, the thing and throw it into the temple and you would get an answer probably from some priest you know, answering it for you. Uh, the ticket oracle goes back centuries in Egyptian history and Christians were doing it well into the Roman Empire, but instead they're writing these little tickets to s- saints instead of Egyptian gods. Wow. So this is like ritual practice that's so deeply ingrained in culture, it just doesn't stop. And so going back to the idea of Mithras, like or the example of Mithras, like these are deeply ingrained things, initiation rituals, secret knowledge. You know, Paul talks a lot about secret knowledge, even though we don't want to call him Gnostic. Um, meeting in buildings and doing liturgies. You know, they were doing liturgies in synagogues, they were doing liturgies in churches, and they were doing liturgies in Mithraea. Like it's it's just how you do religion in that day and age. Ladies and gentlemen, Religion for Breakfast with Dr. Andrew Henry. I seriously appreciate you. I hope everybody goes subscribe to his successful YouTube channel that is highly educational. You give free education to the world. I commend you for that. In fact, I've been watching you for a long time and I've been waiting for this day to be able to have a chat with you. I plan on hopefully having more in the future and maybe seeing you on my friend uh, Neil Gnostic Informant to go and hang out with him. Uh, He's a buddy of mine. And he's a patron of yours as well. So go to the website also, religionforbreakfast.com. He has a Patreon. We got to get him up to a thousand patrons, everybody. This way, uh, what was it you're trying to accomplish? Because I know you're trying to hit a goal here. So I'm so religion for breakfast really focuses on all religions. I don't just focus on early Christianity. I like publishing videos on early Christianity because that's what I study. But I'm trying to publish two mega series, one on Islam and one on Hinduism. I'm hiring scholars of Islam and Hinduism to write these episodes. I I care a lot about not putting out misinformation into the world. So I want to hire actual experts to help write these and to help support, you know, bringing in more more help to make these the best uh, resources for religious literacy on the platform. I'm looking for more resources. So that's mm-hmm. why I'm doing this push for uh, more patrons for 2022 to help find the, fund these two series. And I'm thinking 10 episodes for H- Islam, 10 op- episodes for Hinduism, maybe 25 minutes for each episode. So like a massive amount of content on these two yeah. topics. That is a lot. And of course, that's also a very tricky, sensitive area to go into. And so obviously sticking with scholarship and historical, you know, method and things like that'll be your best bet. Uh, That way people can get like, you know, interpret things at the end of the day. Sure. I know a lot of people who are religious, but they also know how to do historical methodology and they kind of split the two off as two categories. One is in the faith land. And then the other one is, is what can we know and why should we think this? And I'm interested in that side, of course, rather than the faith side, even though I am interested in why people believe I was one of those people. As you said earlier, with the whole uh, magic and and doing these things and casting out demons, it was the social environment. I would like, I would want something to happen. So I would utter speak in tongues and things like that. Like I would kind of go into it. So I know what it's like. um, And that helps me empathize, not be a complete anti jerk if you will to people who are of faith it makes me understand that they don't mean bad and yeah that's i mean this is what i say about religious studies i'm constantly trying to you know ba- tier one of, of religious literacy is understanding what religious studies is because there's always this confusion between theology and religious studies i think religious studies is one of the worst named fields ever <laughs> you know when i say biology you know what i'm talking about when i say anthropology you know what i talk about when i say religious studies you hear that word religious and you're like oh this must be some sort of confessional or devotional scholar and i'm like no religious studies is the secular study of human behavior human behavior that we happen to call religious and that includes everything from sacred texts to rituals to you know political hierarchy and how religion affects politics or music you know religious studies covers so many different fields but ultimately it's a secular field studying human behavior and that doesn't 
you can be religious, you can be not religious and do religious studies because it's a theory and a method being applied to human behavior. Um, and that's what I do in all my, my videos. Some are on Islam. I've done a video on Haitian voodoo. I've, I have a video on like the evolution of uh, religious music, looking at cognitive evolution. So it's a very uh, generalist kind of channel. Thank you so much for uh, giving me your time. I also want to make sure that they go to your website. What can they find here? Uh, I mean, I don't do, do <laughs> I don't do too much on the dot com, but <laughs> you can find some some old some thoughts. I've been meaning to post like the transcripts to my videos on that on the website. But uh, best way to find me would be on the YouTube channel. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at, at Andrew Mark Henry. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any final words you want to tell our audience when they start diving into the subject matter, things that they should maybe look further into, any publications you've put out or things you're working on that you might be trying to do? I mean, I would pick up a copy of the Greek Magical Papyri. Uh, there's a very famous uh, publication by Hans Betz, B-E-T-Z, uh, which is just a compilation of translations. Uh, just keep in mind that you're looking at a translation, a compilation that scholars made. That, you know, nobody has gone out and fi- found the copy of the Greek Magical Papyri. It's a compilation, and just look at some of the most syncretic, wild, uh, ancient texts you can ever come across. Everything from how do I not get a migraine headache to how do I commune with a dead spirit? Like really interesting stuff, and it gets you a pretty good idea of. Uh, Greco-Egyptian religious practice in the late Roman period. Ladies and gentlemen, please go join his Patreon, help support his mission on educating the world broader. Subscribe to his and our Patreon, if you will, and our YouTube channels. I mean, we are on a mission to really bring this public. And that is one of the things I commend Dr. Henry on when I read his website. He, he realized there was a lacuna in YouTube or even the internet world on getting these ideas that I have found as a non-academic are hiding, as the Bible would say, like a candle under a lampstand. It's like they're there, but are you ready to fork out $60,000 to go and specialize in a field in order to find this stuff? Or are you wanting to check us out on the convenience of sitting on your couch or riding in your car, going on a walk, hitting play and saying, whoa. Henry, Dr. Henry just blew my mind. I did not know that about Apollonius Satana. I did not know that about Hinduism. I did not know that about Christianity. I did not know Mark was the earliest gospel. We've been told it was Matthew. There's so many things that um, we enjoy doing. And I think it also is making the world a better place because the religious aren't as fanatical and fundamentalist. And those who are skeptics like me, who would identify as atheists, um, are not being radical either, trying to bridge that gap and have interfaith dialogue is our goal. I don't want to be this <laughs> type of guy. I, I have my moments. Don't get me wrong, especially right now with what's going on. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, thank you for your time. I really seriously appreciate you. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Never forget, we are Myth Vision.